In primary school, my science teacher showed us an experiment using oobleck. Oobleck is a non-Newtonian fluid, that is to say it does not have a constant viscosity. And it's just made up of cornstarch and water. If you pressurize it, such as by punching it, it behaves just like a solid. But if you just stir it gently, it behaves like a liquid. Now, if you've never handled oobleck before, that probably made no sense at all. Perhaps some pictures would help. Still, you won't really know what's oobleck until you concoct the mixture yourself and get your hands dirty. Returning back to math, this has a few meanings. Firstly, you have to plunge into the problem. That's the only way where you can get a feel for what's going on. Secondly, sometimes you will get horrendous algebraic expressions or big calculations, but don't immediately give up whenever such things appear. Finally, and this is really important, you have to actually do the problems. I hope that after this series, you'll be motivated to try some problems on your own as well. Without further ado, let's look at our first example. We are given a sequence that starts with pi and proceeds on according to a somewhat strange rule. How are we supposed to find A1111? Feel free to pause the video here and likewise for the later examples if you would like to think for a little bit on your own. The easiest way to start is by simply calculating the next few terms so that we better understand this sequence. So let's start by finding the next term, which is pi plus 1 over 1 minus pi. If we substitute again, A3 becomes this rather gigantic mess. So what do we do now? Ask yourself, do you better understand the sequence yet? Probably not, and I don't see how we can proceed any further if we just stop at this point. So all we can do is experiment at least a little bit more. So let's try to simplify this. We can multiply the top and bottom by 1 minus pi. And what we get actually isn't so bad. Pi cancels out in the numerator and 1 cancels out in the denominator. And so after we simplify, we're just left with negative 1 over pi. Now, if we substitute back again, a4 becomes negative 1 over pi plus 1 over 1 minus negative 1 over pi. And this simplifies to pi minus 1 over pi plus 1. It may seem that we haven't gone anywhere, but notice that only 1 and pi have appeared in our term so far. In a sense, we can say that things are actually going rather well. So let's do this one more time. I'll substitute it in again. I'll simplify it again. And what do you know? We get a5 is just equal to pi. When solving problems, always keep your eyes open. Don't forget that we started off with a1 equal to pi. By writing down a2 to a5, we've discovered that the sequence is actually periodic and repeats every four terms. Now, dividing 1111 by 4, we get a remainder of 3. And that means that a1111 is the same as a3, which is negative 1 over pi. That was an algebraic problem on sequences. And now, let's look at a number theory problem. This time, we are asked to find all positive integers mn such that 1 factorial plus 2 factorial until n factorial equals to m squared. I'm sure you can tell that we are about to do some experimentation again. But before we begin, let me ask a question that might sound a little silly. Should we list out all the square numbers up to a certain point and check if they are the sum of the first n factorials or should we list out all the factorials to a certain point, sum them up and then check whether the result is a square number? 
I think most of us would intuitively prefer the second. And that's because it is easier to check whether something is a square number than to check whether something is the sum of factorials. And also, there are many, many more square numbers to list as compared to factorials, since square numbers grow more slowly. Remember that even though we are getting our hands dirty, we are not deliberately going to do something silly to slow ourselves down. So, let's list a few factorials first, and then add them up. Well, that's nice. 1 and 9 are both square numbers, so let's note that down that n equals to 1 and 3 give us solutions, or n equals to 2 and 4 do not. We probably need a bit more data before making any guesses though, so let's write down a few more factorials, and then add them again. You probably know that 153 is not a square number, but how about the others? Pause for a moment to think about how to determine whether the remaining numbers below are square or not. Let's look more closely at the sums. You may notice that most of them end in 3, and that's not too surprising, since we are just adding factorials to get from one sum to the next. And we know that the factorials will all end in 0, starting from 5 factorial, and so all the sums will actually end in 3. Now, is this important? We may notice that Square numbers from our recollection don't really end in 3. And in fact, no square number ends in 0, since the last digit will repeat after every 10 squares, and 3 is nowhere to be found in that list. That means, the two solutions we found at the start are the only two solutions, 1, 1, and 3, 3. Hopefully, that was rather satisfying. And for our last example, Let's look at the geometry problem from the Singapore Math Olympiad. In this problem, we are given the quadrilateral ABCD. The diagonals intersect at O, and we are told that angle BAD plus angle ACB are equal to 180 degrees, along with four of the side lengths. From this information, we are asked to find OD over OB. Perhaps you may ask, what exactly am I supposed to experiment with for geometry? My idea? Look for the most unusual piece of information, in this case, the pair of angles summing to 180 degrees, and then try to think of all kinds of ways to make it useful. Again, feel free to pause this video for a moment to think about how you could make use of this information. Let's focus on the diagram. How can we make these two angles interact? Maybe you think of extending BC and AD so that they intersect at some point E. And that way, angle ACE is also equal to angle DAB. Notice that this makes triangles ECA and EAB similar. So the ratio of their sides will be equal. If now we let ED be X and EC be Y, we can form some equations using these ratios. And from there, we could solve for X and Y. But hang on a moment, that doesn't seem to tell me anything about OD, OB, or their ratio. So maybe we should pause for a moment and think, is there something else we can do? Because this seems to be not related to what we are asked to find. Alright then, let's try to draw something more closely related to OB and OD this time. Maybe we can draw OE parallel to AD. That way, we have similar triangles BOE and BDA, and OB and OD will appear somewhere in the ratios of side lengths. At the same time, because we drew a parallel line, angle OEB equals to angle DAB. And so angle OEA is 180 degrees minus the angle, which is the same as angle ACB. As such, we have got another pair of similar triangles AOE and ABC. We know all the side lengths of ABC, 6, 5, and 3, so it seems promising at first glance. 
However, we realize that we know none of the side lengths in triangle AOE, and calling those three lengths 6x, 5x, and 3x doesn't seem to yield too much. So once again, it seems we are stuck. Never mind, let's start over again. Let's try a third method. This time, I'm going to extend AB. I'll force similar triangles to occur by defining E as the point such that EDA is similar to ABC. This is possible because angle EAD is the same as angle ACB. This construction is different from the previous construction because our similar triangle has a known length of 4. That means when we use the side lengths in the ratio 6 is to 5 is to 3, we can actually find the precise values of AE and DE. You might then wonder, since we have constructed the triangle outside the figure, how do we move back in and find OD over OB? Remember that by constructing the similar triangle, we also have equal angles. And the pair that will help us here is DEA and CAB because that implies DE is parallel to CA and we can just move OD and OB downwards towards EA and AB. If you simplify 20 over 3 over 6, that gives us our final ratio of 10 is to 9. Phew, that was exhausting. You might realize though, this is the only slide which actually solved the problem. What then was the point of everything else? I wanted to give you a more realistic look at what actually happens when we attack such problems for the first time. Although the solution gives a pretty nice and clean series of steps, most of the time we don't get it on the first try. We meander around, we try a few different things before we actually find the intended approach. To borrow a commonly used quote by Thomas Edison, I have not failed, I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Thankfully, solving a math problem is still easier than inventing the light bulb. So mostly, we don't need 10,000 attempts before we arrive at the correct approach. Before we end, here's a reminder of what you should take away. Firstly, most problems are deliberately meant to look confusing. So you need to experiment in order to appreciate what is going on. Secondly, you sometimes need to do many tedious steps or make several attempts before reaching the solution. Often, the most messy section comes just before the final elegant insight. So don't stop just a bit too early. Finally, getting your hands dirty is also a state of mind. So don't just be satisfied with watching me or someone else get their hands dirty. You might still be wondering, what if the problem is just so complicated that I have nothing to dip my hands into? In our next video, we'll talk about how you can scale a problem down to a more manageable level. These videos take a bit more time and planning compared to those where I just discussed problems. So I hope you'll be patient and if you find them helpful along the way, please lend your support by liking this video and subscribing to this channel. As always, you can comment below if you have any suggestions or questions about what we have discussed. Thanks for watching and see you next time.